Hello everyone, I'm Peter Evans from the Sunday Times and welcome to our panel today, Beyond the Frontline. The news is saturated with the NHS and the biggest public health crisis facing the country in more than a century. The NHS, I think, has done an incredible job under immense pressure, innovating at pace and forging new and interesting partnerships with external organisations that have helped patient outcomes over the pandemic. As we emerge, two key issues, I think, have become apparent. First, the digital transformation we have talked about for so long is happening now in front of our eyes and changing the healthcare service every day. Second, the challenges that emerge around those changes are becoming more apparent, specifically on what that means for the structure of the health service around issues such as the aging population and their adoption of technology. That's why we're here today. We're going to discuss innovation as it's happening now, what's possible, what's probable, and what the future looks like for healthcare. We've got a great panel who I'd like to introduce you to now, starting please with Shafi. Hi, I'm Professor Shafi Ahmed. I'm a colorectal cancer surgeon uh, based at the Royal Island Hospital. I also co-founded a VR company called Medical Realities, trying to change the way we teach the new generation of healthcare workers. I also help uh, Vodafone as one of the ambassadors. Welcome. Hi, my name is Nadine Hashash Haram. I'm a reconstructive plastic surgeon at Guy's and St. Thomas's Hospital. I'm also the clinical lead for innovation at the Trust, and I'm the founder and CEO of Proximy, a technology platform that's allowing us to support surgeons scaling their expertise across operating rooms around the world. Hi, I'm Anne Sheehan. I head up the enterprise business for Vodafone UK. Hello everyone, I'm Scott Petty, Chief Technology Officer for Vodafone in the UK. I'm responsible for all of the technology we deploy in the UK. Thanks everyone. Uh, now, before we delve into the conversation, there's a quick film to show to give us some context. 2020 has been a year like no other. We've gained a renewed appreciation for health workers, experienced astonishing technological progress, and made public health a global priority. But we've also seen challenges in the current system exposed like never before. We stand on the brink of revolution. The UK is digital, and patients across the country are ready to embrace a new way. Imagine a future where at-risk patients can be remotely monitored in real time, and medical staff can share health data instantly. It's time to reimagine healthcare. From fixing basic hospital inefficiencies and replacing silo mentality with a more holistic approach, to implementing and enabling advanced technologies like 5G and AI, we have the collective vision and momentum to make it happen right now, but we can't do it alone. Together we can replace the old model with something faster, smarter and more patient-centric. Together we can innovate safely, build trust and learn at speed. Together, we can make connected healthcare a reality. Hopefully that set the scene a bit about what is happening on the ground. One thing that occurred to me while watching is that we talk about connected healthcare in the 21st century, but what is actually happening right now? What is the reality? Shafi, if we come to you, please, for that. Peter, thanks very much. Yeah, of course, look, um, technology for the last three months has suddenly exploded, as you've seen through the pandemic, with newer technologies being implemented at pace. We'll talk about that later on, I guess, in the, in the conversation. If you look at outpatients, for example, we have computers, some old, some new, some being replaced. We have dictation machines for real time, voice recording, and also now voice text speech to allow quick access uh, to patients' uh, healthcare records and also to produce letters. On the wards, we're seeing lots of new computers, but also tablets and you know, mobile devices being used to monitor patients' healthcare, which are connected to maybe sometimes what's called cows or wows, which are computer on wheels or workstation on wheels that people wheel around being more mobile around the ward. And we're seeing more monitoring systems coming in 
suppose the basic parameters of physiology like blood pressure, pulse, temperature, and also my mobile ECG machines are more connected now. So we're seeing a plethora of new uh, technology being implemented and more connected. In the surgical world, of course, now playing theatre, we're seeing amazing technologies being introduced. I'm a laparoscopic surgeon, so we see a lot of monitors and HD TV quality monitors plus equipment. And now we're seeing the evolution of robotics. We're seeing robots in most theatres around the country now. So there's a huge interest and change in the kind of the uh, technological uh, infrastructure that we see. Great. Uh, Scott, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that the need for shared services, budgets, integrated care models within health and social care is, is leading to an increased need for collaboration between organisations. Shared data enables multiple services to use, for instance, a single patient record uh, so that frontline workers can provide better care. So connecting all of those devices securely uh, is really critical as we move forward. A, a real world example, Vodafone provides the network infrastructure and endpoint equipment required to run the NHS blood transport service, the secure, reliable network connects donor services with emergency services and hospitals. In doing so, patients are receiving organs faster uh, and it's contributed to almost 30 million pounds in savings to the NHS. Thank you very much for that, Scott. Fascinating stuff. Uh, Nadine, what do you think? I think when we think about Internet of Things, this is a very, fairly broad term that encompasses a whole range of areas, both within the hospital and outside the hospital. This can encompass things like telehealth and telementoring, remote equipment monitoring that Shafi talked about, as well as more primary care uses when we think about remote monitoring of patients at home and in the care homes. And of course, as we've seen with the rise and increase in the use of this, this is really testing our systems when it comes to infrastructure, connectivity and accessibility. But I think also what we need to do is fundamentally think about these resources and these tools and make sure that with the right foundations, they're really solving a problem or providing value for our patients. And that's something that we're really seeing tested out at an accelerated speed across the NHS within the current climate. Thank you, Nadine. That's really interesting to hear. Uh, and now, Anne, on to you, please. I guess if I take all of the elements discussed by the other panellists, I think we can continue business as usual. I think we all know that. I think connectivity has always played a vital part in health. Um, and I think as we've been through the last probably 12 weeks, I think it's had an increased importance. And it's really important that the power of connectivity now involves because if we harness the power of the connectivity, I think it can really be enabler for, back to what Chaffee said in terms of integrated care models, advancements in telemedicine, and also, and most critical, um, is driving efficiency. So we need to embrace the power of technology. We need to embrace the power of um, connectivity and we need to harness it. Um, building on, on, I guess, what Nadine said, if we look at what we've achieved over the last even 12 weeks, the power of Internet of Things, the power actually of what we've managed to do um, with Nadine and, and, and her company Proximy in terms of 5G, so get connectivity harnessed for the power of good to save lives, um, mm. you know, where we've had, where there's been challenges. So I think it's really, really important that we recognize the power of connectivity, that we embrace it and that we power it now going forward to really drive change. Yeah, and clearly there's there's a tremendous opportunity to come out of the crisis. Um, and staying with you, if that's OK, you mentioned business as usual there. What's been the biggest impact um, to business as usual beyond beyond the pandemic? Um, I, I guess to start with, I think like healthcare spending will continue to grow as a portion of GDP as our operation or as our population ages, and we we do run the risk of it becoming unaffordable. I think also citizens and patients we experience digital experience in our in our day to day life, whether we're shopping and when we enter the healthcare system, um, we want to experience a digital experience, and, and I, I think. You know that's nearly a minimum and, and and seen as a norm and in the research that we've um, conducted we can see that nearly two-thirds of community healthcare leaders are seeking to improve the overall quality of the service that they provide on the front line with basically um less budget so we we have to embrace the power of technology for this if we look at mobility is key actually and a good start to addressing this so giving our healthcare leaders at the front line the smart devices so they can access information about their patients, spend more time with them, make it a better quality of service. The second is, I think, 
uh, and probably Scott and, and some of the other panelists can bring this to life, is just tackling legacy. So we've got to tackle legacy, old infrastructure that is basically slowing things down, making things more inefficient, and really um, challenge how we work together as a community to kind of tackle that legacy and make sure that we're bringing the power of technology to really drive that efficiency, but also get us all working together to transform the healthcare system. And is that happening now? Just to stay with you very briefly, because those issues yeah, have been talked about. I mean, you know, if we look at what has been achieved, I mean, just incredible stuff has been achieved in the last um, few weeks. And I think it's, you know, why has that happened? It's because we've had one common goal, which is to save lives. And we've seen great partnerships, great ecosystems form um, for the power of good. And we've seen technology at the core of that, be it 5G, be it 4G, the power of technology, convergence between robot and fixed and everybody working together with one single and common goal and harnessing that technology. And, and it is probably a mindset shift. It's like if we what we've achieved in the last three months needs to become the new norm. We can't go back, as I've said before, to business as usual. We've got to really reflect on how could we move with such speed? How can we get communities working together? Um, you know, Vodafone, other ecosystems, what Nadine does in Proxy, what Chaffee is doing, all with the, the power of you know one common goal. And we just need to reflect on that. You know and and really figure out what brought us together and and how we harness that for good going forward and thank you very much for that really interesting to hear and uh now nadine on to you please i mean i couldn't agree more with what anna is saying clearly the complexities that have been posed with COVID have been unprecedented and these have really catalyzed that fundamental change that's pushing us to what that new normal is going to be the barriers mm. of adoption are dropping We've seen an acceleration and adoption of digital solutions and to some extent moving away from the legacy uh, technologies that Anne referred to. And so I think what's really key is to sort of build on this momentum and to deliver the solutions that we need at scale. And ultimately, at the core of this is ensuring that we're delivering solutions that are fit for purpose now and in the future that can adapt and evolve in an agile way uh, as we have experienced firsthand. And I think we need to really uh, think about the power of all the internet connected devices that we have and what these can do in delivering fundamental care for patients and how that can continue to evolve from 3G to 4G and to 5G. You know, things like video technology and streaming are growing at an exponential pace. And how can we ensure that the core foundations can continue to support that? But I think above and uh, underpinning all of that as well is the key is impact. How are we then therefore using these technologies, these solutions, these foundations and the connectivity to impact and change lives, to improve our health system, to support clinicians and patients in our health system and hopefully more globally as well. And again, that was a great you know, ambition that we had at Proxime. We've done some phenomenal work with Vodafone. We're very lucky to be partners with them. And we are you know, present in over a hundred hospitals around the world and in all the continents today. And I think that is really exciting, seeing that transaction of solutions, technology, connectivity, and accessibility really being delivered. Yeah, it's fascinating stuff. Um, Shafi, coming to you, what are the patients saying about all this at the moment? So I think that's a, the fundamental part of all of this is that it's always about the patient. Technology and innovation is, is fundamentally required to support patient outcomes and patient care. What we're seeing now is actually a major acceptance of patients with technology. Who would have thought three or four months ago we were breaking bad news of telemedicine or through telephone triage, for example? Who would have thought that clinics would be empty because we're going to a virtual clinic and virtual presence. So patients are demanding change. They want immediate access. They want to be connected to healthcare. They want better outcomes. So in this journey that we have in this digital transformation, it's important to take the patient on that journey with you to ensure that what we're doing carefully is safe, it's effective, it's supporting their healthcare and give them some immediacy. So what we've seen is complete change. And what I've seen in this pandemic, I call it the compression of time. It's converted two to five years into like, three months and suddenly we're springboarding to a new kind of world, a brave new world that I call it. And patients are there at the center of that. So we're looking at a data-driven patient-centric healthcare system, which I think will be far more valuable going forward. And as Anne said, it's been more affordable, more equitable and more accessible. And are we likely to look back on, on this time as a, as a tipping point on that journey, do you think? Uh, definitely. I mean, I, I'm, you know, the barriers of adoption have changed, as uh, mm. uh, was mentioned earlier, both, both Anne and Nadine, and we're seeing uh, the new normal, whatever you like to call it. So certainly, 
I think there's a springboard here, it's accelerated. We won't go back. Uh, I think this is the perfect opportunity. We'll look back in time. So actually, this pandemic, although it's desperate and sad to see what's happened with it, it's also a chance to exploit, to expand, to use an opportunity. We'll look back in, 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 in 10, 20 years time, say, well, that's been support our healthcare ambitions to go more digital, to be more remote, and to access healthcare that's fairly around the world. So I absolutely fundamentally think this has changed healthcare for the better. Thank you very much, Shafi. Uh, Scott, coming to you and building on, on Shafi's point, um, let's look at what we're doing now. Obviously, th there's a lot of technology being used and patients are, are used to it. What digital processes are we using and what legacy tech are causing is causing the biggest issue? Well, I think the adoption of digital technologies like video conferencing that we're using now is a real opportunity for the healthcare sector, for telemedicine, for remote diagnostics. Uh, IoT is a wonderful opportunity in connecting services together. We've demonstrated things like connected ambulances, taking all of the instruments inside an ambulance, sharing that information with the doctors in A&E as the ambulance is on the way uh, to the A&E facility, allowing them to do earlier diagnostics. Those kind of digital tools can really fundamentally change the type of care that we can offer to patients. Um, but the current estate of systems is, is actually quite fractured. It's made up of a number of different services. They're often not connected to each other. And generally disparate systems with manually driven processes can lead to gaps in information. That gap in information leads to gap in understanding and, and underutilization of assets like bed availability, et cetera. So understanding where your assets are and how you can use them uh, and when you can use them is key to, to driving quality and efficiency improvements. It's been an initiative for a while actually to, to go digital and become paperless, yet in the absence of a clear way to remove manual processes, paper is still an important requirement for many uh, in the health and social care sectors. And this is really impacting staff efficiency. Thank you very much for that, Scott. And now Shafi, what are your thoughts on this, please? Yeah, so in terms of uh, systems that are a problem, of course, we know the, um, the main problem, of course, uh, in technology in, in the healthcare system is interoperability. We have legacy systems that don't connect, uh, trying to build APIs to connect everything going forward. That's been hard work. There have been inertia, there have been barriers of adoption. There's issues around data privacy and ethics. have all been difficult to manage, but we need to confront these head on to ensure that this connected health we described makes more sense. And you know, when we talk about adoption, of course, looking at these kind of digital transformation and education that's required for staff and healthcare workers to be involved in the whole conversation. So the number of levels I think that have been uh, difficult in the past, we're seeing much more fast paced uh, innovation and translation of clinical practice. So that's encouraging. Uh, electronic health record, for example, is st still a bit cumbersome. It may not be fit for purpose. How does that evolve to ensure that we have enough data and drive the healthcare that's much more precise uh, and personalized? So these are kind of historical things we have in the past, but I'm, I'm convinced that we can overcome some of these hurdles by connecting people and also being looking at the, the future and what we create for ourselves. That's very encouraging to hear. Thank you, Shafi. And now, uh, Nadine, what are your thoughts, please? Absolutely. I mean, with, with both hats that I wear, I think we've definitely seen more of a, a break the glass approach to try and see how we can cut through some of the challenges that Shafi very rightly outlines and think about how to the solutions to fundamentally change the delivery of care and support within a time now, but hopefully the future as well when we think about accessibility and connectivity. And there's an amazing plethora of examples that we could pick from of what's been happening over the last 12 weeks and what we're seeing are changing in how we deliver processes. But if I can just probably uh, refer to one or two examples, one which uh, you know the eminent Andrew Gregory just wrote in the Sunday Times about was how through connectivity and through these internet connected devices, we were able to deliver life-saving care to a patient here in the UK. So being able to have clinicians across the globe connecting to work together to deliver best care to patients. We see them describing this as almost virtually reaching in. And these were things that, you know, a few years ago would never have even been possible. We've also seen that from the industry, how reps and other su support networks are trying to support the industry to deliver care within the constraints that COVID's delivered. And of course, we're even seeing heartwarming experiences where patients are able to speak to their family members who are outside the hospital and many, many others. And it's exciting to see what's happening. I think at the core of it is, of course, stakeholders feel engaged that clinicians, nurses, frontline staff, 
uh, feel engaged and educated about these solutions. And that's a lot of the work that we're doing as well. That's great. Thanks, guys. We've talked about business and digital processes right now in theory. Now let's take some time to put that into context with a few words from Bridgewater NHS before we start talking about solutions. I'm really, really lucky to be a health visitor. I get to have long-term relationships with a lot of families that I deal with and I get to support them antenatally from 28 weeks right through to when their child starts primary school. I can feel that I make such a difference in their lives. Bridgewater Community Healthcare NHS Trust is a community trust in the northwest of England. We provide a range of services for well over a million people. Our staff because of the roles that they do, quite often in patients' homes and other locations, need real-time information and need access to mobile records. Our aim was to be able to do IT anywhere. We had all of our mobile phones from Vodafone at the time, so we asked them about getting 4G-enabled laptops for our clinicians. We ran a device workshop where we had a number of clinicians attend. We chose the Lenovo devices that included a full HD screen, 4G connectivity and a full day's battery life. And we chose to get those supplied by a Vodafone. The clinicians always have access to the full patient record. It's possible to use it in both online and offline modes. So our clinicians can complete care records securely on the go. We've currently rolled out to approximately 1,600 clinical staff. We've also rolled devices into our corporate services and we intend to deploy them even further. When I have the laptop with me, it allows more quality time because if there's certain areas that we need to go into in more depth, they're there at my fingertips. And because I don't have to go back to the office, I can spend more time doing what I love and quality time with my patients. We've just seen the Bridgewater NHS talking about the importance of mobile tech, and we've heard how the current pandemic is changing the face of healthcare and some of the consequences of continuing along the same path. For the second half of this webinar, we would like to look at beyond the front line and understand how we can begin to reimagine healthcare. If you look at Bridgewater, what do you think the first steps would be for them to reimagine healthcare in their environment? Anne, we'll come to you on that, please. Yeah, Peter, I think in most cases, um, it's a mindset shift. So the country has been accelerated, both technology wise and the, um, I guess, the agility to embed. So things are never going to go back to the way they were. And we need to make sure that we learn from the last kind of 12 weeks and move things forward. And I think Bridgewater is a real example of that mindset, the, you know, the desire to change, the desire to put the patient at the core um, of everything that they do. And I think there's kind of two fundamental steps for me. The first is partnerships and ecosystems. I don't think there's any one person, any one department or any one company that can drive this change, but actually by bringing the power of a Vodafone for connectivity, solutions from other organizations, you know, the people and the systems that we need from the NHS, we can actually work together to drive that change. So I think the first thing is partnerships, mindset change, and the willing to work together. The second is harnessing the investment that's been made by organizations, I guess, that are you know supporting the NHS. If I look at Vodafone, for example, we've put hundreds and hundreds of millions investment into our network. And what we want is to drive change in the healthcare sector. We want to harness the investment that we've put in, the power of 4G, the power of 5G, of our mobility solutions, our fixed and convergent solutions to play our part to drive that change. And to do that, we need you know, a mindset where everybody wants to work together. We look at the, the challenges that we face and we work as a community. So software companies, connectivity companies, clinicians like we have um, uh, with Nadine and Shafi working to kind of solve the problems that we face. And I think together we can really look back and take the best of what we've learned in the last few months and harness that by working together, taking the investment of, of um, you know, private industry into the public sector and really, really with excitement drive this change because what we've seen in the last few weeks is exciting, yeah, in terms of the change that we can drive and harness it for good. Yeah, um, well, that, that's 
a great ambition to have, I think. Um, Scott, coming to you, any thoughts? I think it's it's crucial that planning for new technologies is looking at the whole ecosystem and having a really clear destination point in mind, a long-term technology architecture that's open, that allows different applications and devices to communicate with each other, flexible, that can scale up and down with peaks and troughs of demand and resources, and most importantly, secure, so that the data uh, is, is only ever used and shared by the people that need access to that. Um, but when it comes to implementation, rather than trying to boil the ocean by thinking about a centralized, all-encompassing digital transformation, uh, we believe the better approach is to think about overall outcomes that can be improved one by one, but still aligned to the long-term architecture that you're trying to build. The ultimate outcome will be a digitally transformed services that are available to a much broader audience. Thank you very much, Scott. And uh, now over to Nadine. I mean, I would to both speakers, I think both Anne and Scott are right. Really, you know, part of the planning is to think about with these solutions, empowering us to think about a decentralized approach that we can do a lot more without being confined by the four walls of a building and how simply by the impact of connectivity, the, 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 the support and the change behavior that we're seeing, we can really fundamentally change and bring benefits as we're seeing even with the video that was shown previously. We have many examples as we're doing with Vodafone when we think about you know, colonoscopy suites across Cardiff and how we can connect them together and bring through strong connectivity and through these digital solutions, great ways to collaborate, to deliver care to patients and to deliver it at pace and at, at scale really that is required. I would also agree that trying to change everything and boil the ocean is, is a really difficult approach and trying to take much more of an iterative and agile approach to try and consider how we deliver value at every stage is really, really valuable. That further empowers and harnesses the, the power of these techn technologies and gets the buy-in that is required to ensure that these are here to stay and here to continue for the future. Mm. And I understand that approximately you're using augmented reality for surgery and training, is, is that right? Absolutely. What we've tried to do is really deliver a solution that's fit for purpose today by using the connectivity solutions we have today we're able to deliver through interconnected your computers, uh, augmented reality experiences, and more than that, really, a multi-sensory experience that allows you to overlay images and scans um, that brings in artificial intelligence to deliver shared decision-making. And being able to do all of that really is underpinned by connectivity. How do we create a global community of experts? And that is through, through partnership, through connectivity, through private-public partnership, and ultimately through buy-in from the clinical teams and the patients themselves. Yeah, it's fascinating to hear uh, and would barely have been believable five years ago, I think. Um, Shafi, uh, what other technologies like AR do you think are likely to make the biggest impact in the future? So I'll give you, got, of course, this is a great place to be, of course, and a great time to be alive because we've got this convergence of expert mm. technologies coming together same point of human existence and its inflection point, of course. I'll give you examples of my own work, of course. So first of all, we've gone completely virtual um, over the last few months uh, from virtual clinic appointments, which is telemedicine uh, platforms. We are doing uh, voice dictation for all of our patients. And now we're doing electronic consults, um, consent forms. So you consent for patients for uh, operations remotely, etc. So it's completely paperless, completely virtual. That's a big step now as to managing patients in a different manner. I've also used technology to train and educate people. I've used both virtual reality, augmented reality to transport myself as a holoportation, to be an avatar, to be a hologram. And as Nadine said, it's about connecting people. My work is around connecting people's minds, connecting people for the last five years. So how do we scale? How do we um, um, allow a lot more people to get healthcare access or educate many more people around the world using virtual reality, augmented reality, etc. So we've experimented with all of those things. And more recently, going virtual, I actually did a wall round uh, a few weeks ago with my Beam system, which is like a, a telepresent system. It's like an iPad on wheels connected to your smartphone. So you can be anywhere in the world and go around the world teaching, training, or seeing the patients. Three years ago, four years ago, when I used it first, there were barriers. It's more difficult. There was some anxiety around it. Today, it's an open door. You push that boundary. The patients are delighted to see their consultant on a TV screen now. It's normalized. Now you can actually be anywhere in the world and see patients mm. remotely. So that whole world is being connected to get healthcare, as I said before, and we've all said, to make it more accessible. And so it's a fundamental shift away from this um, non-patient-centric care to patient-centric care. It's amazing to hear. And just quickly, I'm interested, is, is there a sort of 
do different ages have different attitudes towards this or is it is it adoption across the board really uh, that's a really good question i think we've been very paternalistic about the way we manage healthcare oh it's, you know, we're not sure you're ready for this and we are the kind of healthcare providers actually the converse is true the public are ready of course young people are digital savvy now uh, and they're very good they understand technology and they want a different kind of healthcare system um, even if you get slightly older actually what i've noticed my patients for example who have cancer diagnosis who may be more elderly are so uh, have been actually accepting of the new way of working being more virtual they've kind of understood they get family support and it's the entire kind of the social system that has changed i always mentioned before that we'd have to re-engineer society for that technology to become commonplace actually the pandemic has re-engineered society already on our behalf making it more available actually these patients far more far more savvy than we ever gave them credit for and that's a been a great uh, positive i think from this pandemic yeah it's a recurring theme that isn't it um of our discussions today. Scott, um, talk to us a bit about the cloud and, and, and use of that uh, in healthcare from the Vodafone perspective. Well, I think there's two really important enabling technologies to, to deliver all the things that Shafi's just been talking about. One of those is cloud because it gives a reliability, a scale and a flexibility at a lower price point that's really critical to ensure those services work and are, are always available to the, the patients and the clinicians. Uh, coupled with uh, IoT or Internet of Things, Nadine touched on earlier, creating secure connectivity between devices and backend applications to enable uh, many of the sorts of processes that, that she was, uh, was sharing with you. Um, the health sector, it, it, to be re really honest, probably lags adoption of some of these technologies. We've been deploying cloud-based unified communications across a number of trusts in the UK. And for many of them, it's the first time they're experiencing cloud technologies. They're learning how to migrate uh, to those technologies and how to use them. Uh, but I think it's a real opportunity for the healthcare sector to adopt cloud and IoT uh, at, at pace to really drive change and, and ensure they've got uh, fantastic applications out in, in the marketplace. Maybe kind of to try and bring it to, to life a little bit, we've just developed a, a new IoT uh, heat detection camera as part of our COVID-19 response. It takes a, a thermal imaging camera connected to our secure operations center and our cloud capabilities. It's able to measure the body temperature of people entering premises and, and take uh, allows the, the organization to take quick but discreet action if someone has a, an elevated body temperature, obviously one of the, the symptoms of COVID-19. Can measure up to 100 people every minute, accurate to, to 0 0.3 degrees uh, Celsius. Um, and it's able to, to, to really help businesses plan uh, for their, their return to work. We've put it in front of uh, all our buildings in our campuses. We're working with sporting stadiums and shopping centers to make sure that their staff um, uh, are safe to, to enter back into the building. And it has a role to play in A&E and ICU to make sure that anyone with an elevated temperature is detected quickly and, and uh, appropriate processes can be put in place. That's only really possible because of taking a, a great thermal imaging camera from a UK technology company called Digital Barriers, using a secure IoT network into a network operation center and having the cloud scalability that we need for digital imaging and thermal uh, management to, to make that scale. All of that's been done without having to implement new technology in our campuses or our premises. It runs, if you like, as an over-the-top service for very quick deployment, low cost, uh, and very easy to scale for the organizations that are deploying them. It's amazing to hear. Um, and Nadine, talk to us a bit about the impact of all these changes on the quality of care, if you don't mind. I think you're absolutely right. I think it's really important that as we deliver the valuable benefits of connectivity and accessibility and trying to do this at scale, that we ensure that we're not reducing the quality of care and it, it, in many cases, actually increasing the quality. And we're already seeing this with solutions like remote monitoring, being able to deliver that into the homes of patients, which is incredibly powerful. And with all the solutions now that we've seen really accelerated and enhanced during the, the last 12 weeks, it's also thinking about how do we combine the best of human expertise with the best of these advanced technologies. And that hopefully the combination that's going to really implement and impact uh, the healthcare system at large. And we're starting to see, as Shafi mentioned, the, the bringings of these solutions or these technologies really fundamentally designing what the future is going to look like when we think about things like artificial intelligence, connectivity and virtual ward rounds. And of course, thinking about how we're able to deliver quality into every single hospital and to every clinic around the world and around our health system is critical. And again, we have first uh, firsthand experience of this. What we really wanted to do with Proximy is to think about how we could reduce variation in care, how through connectivity and through internet connected devices and through solutions like Proximy, we could connect people to try and reduce the variation. And see that we're seeing 
and uh, colonoscopy suites in Wales uh, across the health system here. And of course, we're also seeing that when we think about putting evidence behind it. And evidence, I think, is really important. And a recent paper published showed that actually using these internet connected devices to support clinicians in an operating room is equivalent to having uh, a rep standing there with them. And it's, you know, we're still just scratching the surface. I think there's still a lot more to do. And as the infrastructure continues to improve, we'll be able to really push the system even further to the future technologies that Shafi mentions, like holotransportation and all the future immersive experiences that can hopefully also add value to that. Thank you. Um, okay, right, let's finish with probably the key question. Um, what are the biggest challenges uh, people are seeing at the moment and, and how do we overcome them? So, Anne, I'll come to you, please. Um, I think, Peter, from a human and organisational perspective, there's an underestimation on the value of the ecosystem and all parties working together. And I think there's no avoiding that. We, we've just got to figure that out as we go forward. And I think the role that we play um, from a Vodafone perspective is really supporting the agents of change. If you listen to what Chaffee and Nadine have spoken about, there are some amazing um, individuals driving change in our healthcare system. And our job is to give them the, tech the technology, make it easy um, and make sure that we can use that technology and connectivity for to help them um, advance. So I really, I'm really optimistic um, about what can be achieved. And, and as I said, our job is to support some of the great work that's going on. I think the second is probably accountability and fragmentation. It's, you know, where do you go and who do you talk to to help and, and drive that change? And I think healthcare and I guess the uh, critical services that support it have been missioned by the government to um, have a digital transformation strategy and also to deliver it um, and, and to have it focused on, I guess, two things. One is efficiency and the second is patient outcomes. And I think NHX um, is a unit that's bringing together the um, NHS, the Department of Health, NHS England together with a single you know, mission of driving, bringing everybody together to really drive that digital transformation. And I, I think that's great news. It means that we can you know, work together, common goal and help all the different departments. I also think, you know, we, we work a lot with various different departments and sections of, of health um, within Vodafone. And I've really seen over the last few months, everybody working together with a common strategy and actually looking um, at what solutions other departments are deploying and trying to see if they can harness what each other are doing. And, and we haven't seen that in the past. And I think that again shows a partnership, common goal, people working together. So I think if we can get, you know, people taking accountability that we can support and help, if we can support the agents of change like Nadine and Shafi, and then really you know, harness our technology and the great solutions that we have behind that. And I think we can really, we can really, I guess, drive the change that's needed. Thank you, Anne, for that. Really interesting. Now, Shafi, what are your thoughts, please? Yeah, thanks. And of course, I totally agree with what Anne has said. And what we're seeing now is a closer uh, collaboration between public and private partnerships we hadn't seen before. And this allowed us to translate that much faster. We're seeing a, a slackening or a lessening of the regulations required and their barriers of adoption. And the inertia has changed to now a kind of wonderment and amazement for people to try new things in healthcare practice. But fundamentally when it comes to this, obviously in a group here, we're all the kind of the 1%, 2% of innovators and early adopters. And we need to take the rest of the population with us on that, on that journey, as said before. It's about educating the workforce. The workforce has changed. We're now more flexible. We've spent three months at home thinking about work-life balance. We've become more digital. But has fundamentally the education changed for that? We haven't. We need to produce the digital curriculums. We need to ensure that our workforce has time and capacity and also just digital enabled, has necessary language of digital technologies so they'd be able to converse with their patient and other healthcare workers appropriately. So we need to move that forward. And as Anne has quite rightly said, We've got a convergence of all the right uh, um, partnerships and stakeholders coming together. There's NHSX, NHS England, NHS Digital Academy, for example, entrepreneurs like Nadine who've done amazing work, uh, private companies. We've seen now a coalescence of these, of these companies coming together to support fundamentally the patient. And that's been amazing. And I've really enjoyed the last three months in some ways of seeing how quickly we as a society have transformed our minds and thoughts into creating this uh, connected future health world that we live in. A very defined has, uh, has been a key component of those kind of changes for the future. Again. 
thank you Shafi for that that was very interesting and now to wrap up we'll go over to Scott please I think we've got a lot that we can share. If you just look at the infrastructure perspective, um, much of the NHS relies on fairly outdated, fragmented legacy communication technology that actually gets in the way of effective collaboration. Um, and, and, and ultimately that affects clinical care and good patient outcomes. Um, unified communications done well, goes a long way to addressing the limitations of those legacy systems that are in place. Uh, many trusts though have deployed different systems, maintained outdated telephony systems and have little to no effective convergence strategy in place. In reality, many of the existing inefficiencies that exist across the NHS could be significantly impacted uh, and in fact removed with a, with a great unified communication strategy at the infrastructure level uh, that would enable both hospitals and healthcare environments to, to start to digitize and take advantage of all that we've learned through the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you, everyone. That concludes our discussion today. Uh, there's been some fascinating points made. Um, a couple of themes that I think have emerged. First, change and the appetite for change is here now. There are solutions available that we could be taking advantage of to provide cost efficiencies, savings, and better patient outcomes. Second, we need to make solutions accessible to all. This is an era of co-creation and collaboration. We need to help health organizations tackle digital transformation and assist them with what sometimes must feel like an, an, an enormous task. This is not a one size fits all situation, but let's not underestimate the public's ability to embrace technology and a digital approach to their healthcare. Thank you once again to all our panelists. This is the first in a series of webinars. For more information on the next webinars and for what we've discussed today please head over to vodafone.co.uk